Hello and welcome to your Anatomy and Physiology AHS 131MB and this is your lecture for muscles chapter 10. So we're going to be going through muscle tissue basically we're going to talk about the physiology of muscle and um, muscle tissue um, is made up of this three types of muscle we know that the skeletal muscle cardiac muscle and smooth muscle muscle tissue the cells are specialized for contraction they're unique they're excitable cells and remember in the beginning of the semester i taught you guys there are only two basic types of excitable cells what are they neurons and muscles now out of muscles there's three basic types we have skeletal muscle cardiac and smooth muscle our, our conversation is going to be mostly based upon skeletal muscle so the cells are specialized they have unique names for parts of the cell instead of a um, cell membrane or plasma membrane we call it the sarcolemma instead of the endoplasmic reticulum we call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then we have some real specialized structures to allow for two things to occur and uh, if you remember I spoke about this if you look it up in anywhere on the internet you try to understand skeletal muscle physiology you're going to look for uh, this term called excitation contraction coupling so if you look the common properties here it says excitability and contractibility and it has some extensibility and elasticity so when we think about skeletal muscle contraction to try and understand the physiology of it we're going to have to little bit look at a little bit of the anatomy like we have already we started looking at the anatomy of this the muscle cell um, so we have excitation and contraction and excitation contraction coupling has to do with connecting the excitation to make the muscle contract normally when i teach this lecture i have my own notes we're using this the uh, notes from the textbook here and i usually start out talking about the neuromuscular junction and it's three parts to that word neuro or term neuromuscular and a junction when a nerve meets the muscle it creates a synapse and that synapse is where neuro neurotransmitter is being released by the motor neuron here's an important point as we look at the muscles when we start looking at the neuromuscular junction and we look at the muscle and how it works remember muscles don't just have motor neurons they also have sensory neurons what's the difference motor tells it to contract and sensory is detecting changes in the muscle you know we talked about this several times in class if you looked at um get smart the movie get smarter the, or the show Jaime was a robot it was a humanoid robot so supposedly and he sometimes he would malfunction and take his coffee cup and hit himself in the head he didn't get it just right because he couldn't feel where he was in place properly so we can feel the weight of objects by these proprioceptors within muscles and tendons and ligaments so within the muscle we have specialized structures that can determine the stretching of the muscle from a weight you know the weight of something and the pulling on the muscle so muscle has this ability to contract and it can respond accordingly to what how much it should contract you don't want to over contract or under contract you want to be able to lift something and we have this other term that we're going to look at called recruitment most people don't know that term you know people who are like uh, personal trainers they talk about exercise and they've never heard of the term recruitment and recruitment means how many muscle fibers are being fired per moment and we have these things called uh, fascicles and we'll look at the organization of muscle and how it's bundled and, and insulated each muscle cell has an insulation around it and they, they're bundled in groups of muscles called fascicles and then fascicles form a big muscle then we talk about muscle cells and muscle fibers glycogen is the principal polysaccharide in the human body that's where we store our glucose so you'll see on a muscle cell slide you will see some glycogen inclusions so skeletal muscles contain mostly skeletal muscle tissue and there are connective tissues coverings and there's blood vessels it needs good blood supply and good nerve supply 
Okay, so the three layers of the connective tissue of the skeletal muscle are on the outside, over at or upon, would be the epimysium. That surrounds the entire muscle organ. So if you're looking at like a biceps brachii or a triceps, surrounding the entire muscle would be an epimysium. Then there are bundles of muscles called fascicles, and they'll be surrounded by a perimysium. And then each individual muscle cell fiber, when I say muscle cell, you say what? Muscle fiber, right? So each individual muscle cell or fiber has a endomysium, a connective tissue covering around it. Now that's not the, the membrane. That's not the cell membrane. That's a connective tissue covering that surrounds it and insulates it. You would have taken a slight light cut and then you take the blunt end of the scalpel, put it on there and peel back the skin. You can literally put your gloved hand in between there. So it's uh, connected to the deep fascia and it separates the muscle from the surrounding tissue. So the superficial fascia is above the epimysium. The epimysium is actually the deep fascia. It's part of the deep fascia and it separates the muscle from the surrounding skin and everything else around there. Perimysium surrounds, like I said, bundles called fascicles. Again, collagen fibers, lots of elastic fibers, blood vessels, nerves running through there. And then the endomysium surrounds individual muscle cells or fibers and contains capillary networks. It also will be where you find the myosatellite cells, which are the stem cells to repair the damaged muscles, and you'll see nerve fibers there. Okay, so collagen fibers of the epimysium, perimysium, and endomysium come together and they form a tendon. I've talked about this before. And a tendon is a connective tissue that attaches muscle to bone. So tendons connect muscle to bone, ligaments connect bone to bone. So that tendon is going to insert its way into the bone through what? The periosteum. It goes in through Sharpie's fibers and attaches to the periosteum, the bone. An aponeurosis is a broad, flat tendon. And you'll see them, like when we look at the, uh, we looked at a little bit, we said, we talked about this frontalis and the occipitalis, and there's an aponeurosis between that. And then if you look at the, I call it the only Italian muscle in the body, the tensor fascia lata, that and the gluteus medius attached to the iliotibial tract. That's a big aponeurosis. And then the abdominal muscles come to the center of the linea alba. It's kind of like an aponeurosis. So here you're seeing an example of a muscle. And this muscle has um, is showing you a cross-section of it. And you can see surrounding the cross-section in figure A up top, you see the epimysium surrounding the entire muscle. And then in between bundles is the perimysium. And then each individual muscle cell has an endomysium. Here you're seeing one of those fascicles and the fascicle is surrounded by the perimysium and there are individual muscle cells in there and they would have an endomysium around it. So they have an extensive vascular network that delivers oxygen and nutrients and they contract when it's stimulated by the nervous system. It's under voluntary control. In other words, you have to think about contracting your muscles, but the central nervous system can override that like with the fever giving you chills and uh, contractions. Skeletal muscle fibers are enormous compared to other cells. They contain hundreds of nuclei. They're multinucleated. They develop by the fusion of these embryonic myoblasts, and they're also known as striated muscle. And here you see the, how it develops, and you see on the bottom the mature muscle fiber with its multinucleated and those lines called striations. The striations are formed because of an overlap of filaments within the muscle. The sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle fiber. It surrounds the sarcoplasm, which is the cytoplasm of the muscle. And so that's the cell membrane, the sarcolemma. Now, you see where it says here, a sudden change in membrane potential initiates a contraction. So now that membrane is going to be stimulated. It's an excitable cell, so that membrane can be stimulated. When it's stimulated, it causes a depolarization, and that depolarization creates a wave. If you remember in the classroom, we did the wave, had everybody bring their hands up and stand up, remember that, 
And so the sudden change actually travels from point A to point B. So wherever it's stimulated, it's usually stimulated in the center of the muscle fiber and goes both ways, right and left, and then three-dimensionally through the muscle, through the T-tubules, which we're going to look at. So these transverse or T-tubules are tubes that extend from the surface of the muscle fiber into the sarcoplasm. So it's actually a continuation of the cell membrane, but it's going transversely through the muscle. And they have an ending point, and they end at what's called the triad. And the triad is one T-tubule and two terminal cisterns. Now a terminal cistern are these little sacs within the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it's filled with calcium ions. So the tubes extend from the surface of the muscle, go deep into the sarcoplasm, transmitting this action potential, this wave that was going along the membrane right and left, now it's going through these tubes. And it travels down like an electrical charge, and it's going to trigger contraction. Okay, so, oh, I, I actually paused it. I don't even know if I was talking there. Oh, man. Okay, so the excitable membranes, this is the membrane of the skeletal muscle. They're found in skeletal muscle fibers and neurons. We said that two excitable types of cells are muscle cells and neurons. Their membranes can depolarize and repolarize. And as they depolarize, it can send an actual wave of depolarization from point A to point B down the membrane, traveling. Kind of like we did in class when we did the wave, have one row stand up with their arms in the air, the next one, next one, next one, next one, it, it flows. So there's an actual depolarization event that's actually traveling down the membrane. And the skeletal muscle fibers contract due to stimulation by motor neurons. Like I said, it's a motor neuron that's triggering that to do. And this is the point that I usually start out when I talk about skeletal muscle right here. This is really where I start. Because if you have like an appliance in your house and you're wondering if it works, the first thing you want to see if this switch goes on, if it turns on. Is the switch on and off? Is it plugged in? 
The neuromuscular junction is what plugs in the muscle. The nerve is connected to the muscle at a site on the muscle, and it's mid-fiber. It's usually mid-fiber. So you have a motor neuron connecting to the, the, the actual skeletal muscle cell membrane at a specific location. So let's read this. The neuromuscular junction, or the NMJ, and there's three parts to that word, neuro, or that term, neuromuscular, and a junction. Think about that. There's the nerve part, there's the muscle part, and the junction between the two. And the synapse is that junction. So the synapse is, is between the neuron and the skeletal muscle. And the axon terminal of the motor neuron releases a neurotransmitter into a space called the synaptic cleft. So the nerve is attached to the muscle, but there's actually a little gap between the, 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 the distal end of that neuron called the axon terminal, and, that, and there's an actual space called the synaptic cleft. And the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, abbreviated capital A, capital C, small h, ACH or acetylcholine, and remember what I had you do, I had you memorize acetylcholine. We said it's excitatory in skeletal muscle, yet what? inhibitory and cardiac muscle. So neurotransmitters are used in many different parts of your body, but acetylcholine is excitatory in the skeletal muscle. And so this neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, let's go back to reading it, it binds to and opens a chemically gated sodium channel on the muscle fiber. Okay, remember we said some cells have gates, gated ion channels? There are gated ion channels and there are just passive ion channels. And there's three types of gated ion channels. Do you remember? Number one, we said we had ligand or chemical gated. Same thing, ligand or chemical gated. When a chemical fits into a receptor, it has to fit into the right receptor. So it has to be, in this case, it has to be a cholinergic receptor or an acetylcholine receptor. We call that cholinergics. So when you're dealing with drugs as a nurse, you may have an anticholinergic medicine. You know, when they do this intubation, when they do intubation, they paralyze the patient with rapid sequence intubation. They give the patient a drug to paralyze all the muscles. And it's an anticholinergic. And so it blocks all the choline receptors. So now you can't send a message to it. That's one thing it does. And by blocking those acetylcholine receptors, you can't contract your muscles. So they paralyze you so they can intubate you without you fighting somebody sticking down you something in your throat and then they actually will sedate you to the point of almost a coma and uh, I guess if they keep you on a ventilator you are in a comatose state uh, medically comatose state and um, so the acetylcholine is going to bind to a receptor on the skeletal muscle cell membrane on the sarcolemma at a specific site called the neuromuscular junction. So the neuromuscular junction literally has receptors at a specific location for these chemicals. And actually the membrane is modified there. You're gonna see how this membrane is actually modified with junctional folds. That's a key term, junctional folds as we go through this. And the junctional folds are lined with many, many, many receptors for acetylcholine. And it has connected to the receptor these uh, sodium channels. They're chemically gated sodium channels. So the chemical is acetylcholine that opens the gate and allows only sodium to rush in. So if you remember from our memorization about uh, sodium versus potassium, where is there more sodium? Inside your cells or outside? Inside or outside? <laughs> there's more sodium ions outside the cell. Why? Because there's sodium potassium pumps pumping out three sodium for every two potassium back in, right? And that's important. So now as soon as you open up a gate for sodium on a cell membrane, sodium goes where? If there's more sodium outside, it's going to go where? The sodium would rush in because of concentration gradient, right? So you physically are opening up this gate through a chemical. The chemical is received in a receptor which triggers the gate to open. Okay, so I like using the analogy of Cruella de Vil, 101 Dalmatians, right? So Cruella de Vil is driving that 
car on a rainy night, stormy night. She's evil, right? She's coming to her evil castle. She pulls up to the castle and the gate has to open. Well, if imagine the only way to open up that gate was to put like a chemical that looked like a tennis ball into a receptor that can fit, fit that tennis ball. So you take that ligand of that chemical, like the shape of a tennis ball, you put it right in the receptacle, which has look a little cup type of thing for just big enough for a tennis ball. And as soon as it goes into that cup, the gate opens. And that's what ligand gated ion channels do. They receive a chemical, a small shape of a chemical, fits into the receptor, and then the gate opens. Now in this case, the gate opens, it's gonna open and allow things to flow through, but this is a specific gate. This gate is only for sodium ion. So sodium ion has what kind of a charge? What does it say there? Positive charge, the sodium ion. And the cell membrane of skeletal muscle at rest is minus what? Minus 70 millivolts because it's more negative inside than outside. If you rush in a bunch of positive ions, you're going to change that membrane from a minus towards what? If you're already minus, it's going to go towards zero, right? So it's going to depolarize it. It's polarized because there's a difference on one side versus the other. And once it does that, it triggers an action potential. Now, how does it do that? Because there's voltage regulated ion channels right next to it all along the membrane and through the T-tubules. Okay, so here, let's go back. You know, I went ahead. We're going to come back now to the neuromuscular junction. So what you're seeing here, uh, number one, you have the junctional folds of the motor end plate. You see that? So that portion, you see the synaptic cleft, that's a space, and the blue structure is the terminal axon of the neuron, of the motor neuron. And then within that terminal axon are these little vesicles filled with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And now, and then you see the um, junctional fold, see how it's folded to increase surface area, and there are many receptor ion channels, ligand-gated ion channels, ligand-gated sodium ion channels. And so one of those little red guys are going to come out, not one, it's going to erupt through exocytosis, just like it would in any type of cell. So the vesicle releases its neurotransmitter through a process of exocytosis. Remember that? The way things get in and out of a membrane, this is leaving it, so it's exiting. So exocytosis is released into the synaptic cleft, that space between the terminal axon and the neuromuscular junction that's modified into junctional folds. And that space is called the motor end plate where these neurotransmitter receptors are on the neuromuscular junction is called the motor end plate. And those neurotransmitter substances will be released. But it doesn't get released until the neuron receives an action potential. So your brain tells you to release, tells you to contract. So there's a, an axon that's getting depolarized prior to this, which we'll talk about when we get into the nervous system. And as you get to the end of the neuron, at the end of the axon, it stimulates it to cause the release of the acetylcholine. Now watch, that acetylcholine comes out. And there's another step in between we're gonna learn about, but let's just see what happens. It got stimulated and caused the acetylcholine to be released. And the acetylcholine is gonna fit into the receptors. See that? It fits into the receptors, the acetylcholine receptors. It opens up the acetylcholine receptor membrane channel for sodium. And then sodium, which is in the cytoplasm, will rush in. Okay. Now, the red is the acetylcholine. They're not showing you the sodium here. The sodium is much smaller, and there's a ton of it in that uh, synaptic cleft because that's more sodium outside the cell than inside, right? Sodium rushes in. That sodium triggers the action potential. Now, it doesn't explain here what's happening when it does get that action potential down the membrane, which I will explain eventually. But the first thing we've got to realize is that I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back here for a second. I can't go back. Okay. So what we have to realize here is that 
the the neurotransmitter is going in now this picture is showing how when there's excess neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft after it's achieved its job that has to be removed and it's shown you ACHE that's acetylcholine esterase now we'll talk about that in a few moments excitation contraction coupling this is the key I've been telling you guys about so the action potential is the excitation part the contraction portion has to do with the troponin and the calcium ion <clears throat> so what happens is an action potential will travel down the membrane now this is after the neuromuscular junction was stimulated by acetylcholine and what's going to happen is now there's going to be an action potential that travels the entire length of the muscle fiber both ways see the neuromuscular junction is always found mid fiber so it's going to be going to the left and to the right down the length of the membrane and look travels down through three-dimensionally into those T tubules traveling down that membrane and if you remember I talked about imagine you buy a house you go to check this house out and it has a pool in the basement that's really cool a really nice swimming pool but when you walk in the living room the floor is a is a actual pool liner the whole house the floors are all pool liners and they're a little bit wet there's always a little sprinkle of water on it and then in each room there's a tube like a slide but it's big enough for you to fit through and if you wanted to go swimming you just go into the tube and just jump down you're sliding through this tube and you end up splashing into the pool and so the action potential is traveling down the pool liner imagine if you put an electrical charge like in one of these crazy movies like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Bruce Willis and these guys are coming to get him so he hoses down the living room and then he gets an electric appliance and throws it right onto the floor and the whole floor would be uh, electrified through the t-tubules too and so now this is traveling down those t-tubules to the triad if you remember the triad is made up of a t-tubule and two terminal cisterns now what we didn't talk about was that there's so much calcium filled in those cisterns it's so much that when it's released there's 1000 percent more calcium ion in the sarcoplasm after the release then and that's during muscle contraction so the calcium ion gets released from the terminal cistern and it floods and surrounds those sarcomeres completely and the calcium ion binds to the troponin tropomyosin complex and changes its position it exposes the active site on the thin film it's pulling the manhole cover off and now the myosin head can grab that manhole cover and pull the fiber towards the center line and that's the contraction cycle being initiated so here's a um, excitation contraction coupling neural control the skeletal muscle fiber contracts when stimulated by a motor neuron now motor neuron it ends at a neuromuscular junction the stimulus arrives in the form of an action potential at the axon terminal and then it releases its neurotransmitter and it causes excitation and the excite I'm sorry let me rewind number one the neuromuscular junction receives a motor neuron and it releases its neurotransmitter because the neuron got excited and it caused the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft the release of the calcium ions is after the cell membrane the sarcolemma received that neurotransmitter um, received the sodium ions that rushed in and traveled down the membrane and caused a depolarization that travels through the t tubules to the triads and then there's a release of calcium ion that calcium ion that release of the calcium starts the contraction phase so prior to the release of the calcium ions that's all excitation phase the motor neuron the release of neurotransmitter the uh, reception of the neurotransmitter the opening of the ion channels the sodium ions rushing in the depolarization of the entire skeletal muscle membrane three-dimensionally through the t tubules until the release of the calcium ions now the contraction cycle begins 
And so contraction cycle begins when the calcium ions bind to the troponin and the resulting exposure of the active sites on the thin films. This allows a cross bridge formation. That's when the myosin head attaches to the thin filament at that manhole cover. And it's called a cross bridge. And this will continue as long as there is ATP available. And we'll talk about that for that myosin head to fire like an explosion and grab it. Then when it does grab it, it swivels and the sarcomere shortens because it's pulling the thin filament towards the end line. So number six, during the contraction, the entire skeletal muscle shortens and produces a pull or tension on the tendons at the near end. So the contraction cycle begins after it's been excited. It was excited through the T-tubules all the way down to the terminal cisterns. And what happens now is that the terminal cistern is going to release the calcium ions. And that triggers the active site exposure, number two. When the active site is exposed, the myosin head was already cocked and ready like a, a weapon. You pull the trigger back and it's ready to fire, baby. All it needs is a little bit of a stimulus to get it to fire. So that active site gets exposed. That, that, that myosin is cocked and ready through ATP. As soon as that myosin head sees, or as soon as that active site is released, revealed, the myosin swivels and grabs uh, or, or engages as a cross bridge. Then it pivots, number four, and it pulls it towards the midline. That's called power stroke. So how did the cross bridge formation occur? The active site was exposed. But you realize that the myosin head was already cocked and ready through ATP. It actually pulls it back and prepares it for its next contraction. And then once it grabs that myosin, um, the active site on the actin, the myosin head will swivel and pull it towards the midline. That's called power stroke. Then it releases, that's cross bridge detachment, and then the myosin head is reactivated through ATP. So here, the contraction cycle involves a series of interrelated steps. It begins with the arrival of calcium ions. That's from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, flooding the sarcomere. A thousand percent more calcium ions during the cycle than when it's at rest. So those sarcoplasmic reticulum terminal cisterns are big sacs filled with calcium ions. Now, as we're going to see, this calcium ion is released and it does move the active site out of the way and starts the phase of contraction. Realize that calcium ion is going to go back eventually and be stored back into that cistern. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But right now, as soon as it got stimulated, as soon as the T-tubule sent its wave all the way down to the end at its terminal end, the terminal um, terminal cisterns at the triad where the T tubule meets the two terminal cisterns, they open up and they soak the entire sarcomere with calcium ions. And that opens up and reveals the active site. Now the calcium ions bind to it kind of like an enzymatic reaction and it shifts the change of the shape of the molecule and it moves it off the active site. Now, the myosin head was already charged and ready. So what you're seeing here, it's cocked with ADP plus phosphorus, and then it fires, the ATP fires, and then it grabs it, and it forms a cross bridge formation. Once the active sites are exposed, it energizes the myosin head and brings them across and creates this cross bridge. After the cross bridge formation, the energy that was stored in the resting state is released as the myosin head pivots towards the end line. This action is called power stroke. And when it occurs, the bound ATP, ADP and phosphate group are released. It actually releases it. So it's stored energy and then it releases it in an explosion. Now it detaches. So the cross bridge detachment is when another ATP ATP binds to the myosin head and the link between the myosin head and the active site 
are broken. The active site is now exposed and able to form another cross bridge. So another myosin head will grab it again. And it reactivates the myosin head. And so it recocks the myosin head. So here's a resting sarcomere. And then here is contracted sarcomere. So the generation of muscle tension, when muscle cells contract, they produce a tension. To produce movement, tension must overcome the resistance, and the entire muscle shortens at the same rate, because all sarcomeres contract together. And the speed of the shortening depends upon cycling rate, number of power strokes per second. During the contraction, uh, duration of sorry duration of a contraction depends upon duration of neural stimulus in other words as long as the nerve is sending the message to make it contract it's going to keep contracting and the second thing is you have to have enough calcium ions in the cytosol for it to reveal the active sites and then you must have enough ATP to keep recocking the myosin head so it can disengage and, and re-engage and cause a myosin head to attach to the thin thin filament and swivel. Now, the calcium ion is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then the calcium concentration falls. That's when you stop. If you want to stop sending a message, you have to first stop. If you want it to relax, you have to stop sending the message. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But also, when it stops, it has to recapture all the calcium ion. So what this is saying, the, number one, the calcium ion detaches from the troponin. The troponin goes back into its original position, blocking the active site. The term rigor mortis is when you have a muscular contraction after death. What happens, the ATP runs out and the ion pumps cease to function and the calcium ions build up in the cytoplasm. It's a breakdown of tissue and then it causes the swivel. So steps to initiate, this is a review, steps to initiate a muscle contraction. First of all, if you look to the right of number one, the axon, which is the, the motor neuron, the terminal, the very end of the motor neuron, the axon terminal will release its neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction. And then the receptors at the, at the motor end plate where it has junctional folds, as many receptors, receiving the acetylcholine, those are cholinergic receptors, associated with a sodium ion channel. And so the ligand fits into the receptacle, which is the ligand is the acetylcholine, that's the chemical. It opens up the gate. The gate is specific only for sodium ions. Sodium ions rush in, and it creates an action potential going down the wave. Now we're gonna talk about that action potential a little more when we discuss the nervous system, but there are voltage regulated ion channels all along the membrane through the T-tubules, and they are gonna open in succession. And so you're gonna get this wave of depolarization traveling down the membrane both ways, left and right, and through each T-tubule. When it comes to the end of the T-tubule, it comes to where the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum has it stored in these sacs called terminal cisterns. And the terminal cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum open and flood the sarcomere with calcium ions. That's number three. And then number four, the active sites become exposed and then a cross bridge forms because the myosin head was ready and waiting, cocked and ready and then it actually grabs and creates a cross bridge and swivels and brings the thin filaments towards the end line. That's the contraction phase. Now, how do you stop muscle contraction? Well, first of all, you have to stop sending the impulse to tell it to contract, number one. And then there's a lot of excess acetylcholine that's been in the synaptic cleft from the last contraction. And you have to remove acetylcholine from the synapse. And there's three ways we remove acetylcholine. So take out a pen and a piece of paper if you haven't. So acetylcholine can be removed from the sarcoplasmic, I'm sorry, 
from the synaptic cleft at the neuromuscular junction in three ways. Number one is reuptake. So the axon can reuptake some of that acetylcholine. Number two is what they're showing here, acetylcholine esterase is breaking down the excess neurotransmitter within the synaptic cleft. That's from that's what we call enzymatic degradation through acetylcholine esterase. Enzymatic degradation. Acetylcholine esterase is an enzyme and it's going to break down the acetylcholine that's left in that synapse so it can't cause another contraction. And then the other way, the third way is leakage. Some of the neurotransmitter leaks out. Now, those three things are pretty consistent with most um, synapses, chemical synapses in the human body between nerves and, and organs, glands, and muscles. Number seven, the second thing is all those calcium ions that were in a thousand percent more during the contraction phase, the calcium ions surrounding the sarcomere, have to be returned. And they're reabsorbed and brought back through a protein called calcium. Hold on a second. It's called calcequestrin. Calcequestrin. C A L S E Q E S T R I N E. Calcequestrin. And that is going to take up the excess calcium and bring it back to the sarcoplasma reticulum terminal cisterns. And the name cal sequestrin tells you it's going to sequester calcium back. Then the active sites get covered and the calcium ions are returned to normal when the active sites now become covered again and the contraction ends. And then muscle relaxation, occur, relaxation occurs. Okay, so now when a muscle contracts and you want to detect it, you can use what's called an EMG, an electromyogram. An electromyogram will measure the electrical activity in the skeletal muscle. But if you look at this, it talks about how there is a latent period, a contraction phase, and the relaxation phase. The latent period has to do with the time it takes to actually generate an action potential once the neurotransmitter has been released in the synaptic cleft. And the time for the action potential to travel from the motor end plate or the neuromuscular junction down the membrane through the T-tubules, release the calcium, and then start the contraction phase. So there's a latent period phase that has to do with the excitation of the muscle. And then there's a contraction phase once that calcium was released and the calcium actually has to bind to the troponin and the tension builds to a peak and then you have a relaxation phase when the calcium ions are removed from the cytoplasm or sarcoplasm, sarcoplasm and the cross bridges detach. So if you look at this image here, it shows you there's a stimulus at point zero, but the contraction phase now let's look at just the soleus muscle. It's showing you different muscles, their, their, their uh, contraction. So the zero to the black dot, all three of those muscles will not contract until the neurotransmitter was released, taken up by the receptor. It opens up the sodium ion channels. It causes a depolarization wave down the membrane through the T-tubers that cause the calcium release. That's the latent period from zero to whatever that number is. It's close to three or four, maybe two to three. And so that's in seconds, right? So now you have this phase of a contraction phase. Notice how the line peaks and then it drops down. That's a beautiful uh, chart there, right? And so here it's showing you the stimulus at zero and the contraction phase was somewhere around three there, it looks like, right? And the maximum tension is in the mid wave all the way at the top. And then the relaxation phase is towards the end.
There's something called TREPI, and that's a stair-step increase in tension caused by repeated stimulations to the muscle. So that was a single twitch what we saw there, just one impulse, and then it just caused the muscle to twitch and relax. Now there's something called TREPI, a stair-step increase in tension caused by repeated stimulations immediately after the relaxation phase. So it, it contracts, and as soon as it relaxes, you do it again and again and again and again. And if you do it at a stimulus frequency of less than 50 per second, it produces a series of contractions with increasing tension, typically seen in cardiac muscle, but not skeletal muscle. And then wave summation is when you're increasing the tension due to summation of twitches caused by repeated stimulations before the relaxation phase. So before the muscle completely relaxes, you do another stimulus, another stimulus at less than 50, greater than 50 per second, excuse me. So here on the left is the trepi. So it's an increase in a peak tension with each successive stimulus delivered shortly after the completion of the relaxation phase. The fiber's maximum potential tension is not reached until tetanus. And we'll talk about that's complete tetany. We'll talk about that. Here to the right in figure B is wave summation. And that occurs um, when the successive stimuli arrive before it can relax. And see how it creates a stronger and stronger contraction phase. So tetanus is maximum tension. And there's two types of tetany. There's incomplete and complete. Incomplete tetanus means the muscle produces near maximum tension caused by rapid cycles of contraction and relaxation. A complete tetanus is a higher stimulation frequency and it eliminates the relaxation phase completely and the muscles in continuous contraction and all potential cross bridges occur. So on the left is your incomplete tetanus, on the right is your complete tetany. The tension produced by skeletal muscle depends on the number of stimulated muscle fibers. Okay, this is important. Remember, if you looked at the cross section of the muscle, it's made up of many fascicles of muscle fibers and then individual muscle fibers. How many muscle fibers fire at once? We don't do tetany. That's not a normal way our muscles contract. They take turns contracting. So let's look at this. We have this thing called a motor unit. And a motor unit is a motor neuron and all its muscle fibers it controls. It may contain only a few or thousands, depends on the type of muscle we're talking about. A fasciculation is an involuntary muscle twitch. You ever have one of those, a muscle just jumps? It's unlike a true twitch, it involves more than one muscle fiber when that does this. So that's a fasciculation. Recruitment, this is an important point when we talk about um, motor units. So whenever you contract, and if you look at like a basketball player in these days and ages, when I was a kid, they weren't as ripped as they are now, but they're holding a basketball up like they're going to shoot. And you look at their deltoid and you see it kind of doing this, like taking turns, the muscles are fire, firing, going brr, brr, like a machine gun. And that's recruitment. So it doesn't take all his muscles to hold that basketball in that position. It may take, let's say, several fascicles of that deltoid to do it per moment. And they're all taking turns just to hold that basketball in place. And so recruitment is when you increase the number of active motor units. Now, the more weight, the more you need to recruit muscle fibers. The lighter the weight, you don't need to recruit all of them at once. So recruitment produces a smooth, steady increase in tension. The maximum tension is achieved when all motor units reach complete tetanus, which is not normal. We don't usually do that. And they can be sustained for a very short period of time. Sustained contractions produce less than maximum tension. Motor units are allowed to rest in rotation, so they take turns. Here, showing you a cross section of the biceps, and you see the nerve coming from the spinal cord. And these are the motor neurons coming from the ventral horn. That's the ventral horn, that gray, uh, brown area where they're coming off. That's where motor. So those are motor nerves coming. And you see you have three individual axons. And they're going to different fascicles. So like the red is going to, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight fibers of the, you know, oh no, it's uh, actually showing six fibers. And the blue is going to one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the purple is going to one, two, three, four, five, six. 
each one of those nerves has specific muscle fibers it's innervating. Innervating mean sending the uh, nerve to it. And those are considered motor units. The, uh, the blue, the purple, and the brownish or peach color are all individual muscle unit, motor units. So when you have tension, motor unit number one fires, then it relaxes. Motor unit number two fires. Motor, and so that's what you're seeing that basketball player's deltoid doing that. They're all taking turns. The motor units are taking turns to fire to hold that basketball. If it was a really heavy weight, they'd have to do it more frequently to almost tetany if it was a really heavy weight. And then what happens, the muscle would fatigue because it can't hold it there forever. Okay, so I don't think we could play this video, but I'm going to place this actual basic uh, PowerPoint on your, on your Blackboard plus this video PowerPoint. Muscle tone is when... Uh, you have normal tension and firmness of a muscle at rest without causing movement. The motor units actively stabilize position of bones and joints. Elevated muscle tone increases resting energy consumption. So the contractions are classified based upon their pattern of tension. Isotonic versus isometric. Isotonic means there's movement. Isometric, there's no movement. Isotonic means there's a shortening of the muscle actually you actually see the mo movement of a moment arm and it's performing some sort of work. Isometric, there is a contraction, but there's no real shortening of a moment arm. In other words, like if you held your arm straight out to your side and you bent your elbow, that would be movement. That would be an isotonic. But if you just held your arm out there holding something in midair without moving anything, muscles contracting, but there's no shortening of a moment arm. So isotonic contraction is when a skeletal muscle changes its length and it results in motion or movement. Isotonic has two phases, concentric and eccentric. Concentric is when the muscle tension causes resistance and the muscle shortens and it's pulling. Let's say you're doing a curl. You have a, uh, let's do the one arm curls with a beer in the hand. So you take a beer and you bring it towards your mouth <laughs> you're bending your elbow, bring it to your mouth. That's a movement. The muscle is shortening and the arm is movement, right? There's movement there and you're performing work. The work is bringing the beer to the mouth. Isotonic also has an eccentric phase. So the concentric phase in the bicep is when you bench your arm, bring in the beer to your mouth. When you bring your arm back to bring it, the beer back down to the table, that's the eccentric phase. There is muscle tension, but the muscle is elongating as it's doing that. So this shows you an isotonic contraction. The muscle contracts. Uh, and this is showing you an eccentric. So let's go back. If you go back, you see the muscle shortened, and this way the muscle is elongating. But think about this. Don't even look at this picture. Let's think about it for a moment. When you did isotonic, you actually move something. And as you brought it close to your body, it was concentrically contracting. And as you bring it away from your body, it's eccentrically contracting. Now, isometric is different. Isometric is when you're holding the muscle in one spot. There's no change in length. So doing an iron cross on the rings or holding a rifle in front of you with your arm straight out and not moving, just holding it straight out in front of you, that would be isometric contraction. And the muscle, actually, the myosin heads are engaging, but there's no shortening of the muscle and movement. There's no movement. It's held in one spot. Okay. So load and speed of contraction are inversely related. The heavier the load, the longer it takes the movement to begin. Tension must exceed the load before shortening can occur. This talks about small load, a large load. Muscle relaxation and the return to resting length. Elastic forces. The tendons can recoil after contraction and helps return the muscle to normal length. Opposing muscle contractions return a muscle to its normal length. And gravity can do that. ATP or adenosine triphosphate is the only energy source used directly in muscle contraction. The contracting muscle uses a lot of ATP and muscles store enough ATP to start a contraction. More ATP must be generated to sustain the contraction. 
At rest, skeletal muscle fibers produce more ATP than needed, and the ATP gets transferred into creatine, and creating creatine phosphate, and that's used to store energy. And it can get converted back into ATP. The enzyme creatinine kinase catalyzes the conversion of ADP to ATP using energy stored in creatinine phosphate. When creatinine phosphate is used up, other mechanisms are used to generate ATP. ATP is direct, generated by direct phosphorylation of ADP by creatinine phosphate. Anaerobic metabolism, otherwise known as glycolysis, 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 oh my gosh, glycolysis, and aerobic metabolism is the citric acid side electron transport chain. So glycolysis or anaerobic process is an important energy source for peak muscular activity. And that's the breakdown of glucose from glycogen stored in the skeletal muscle. It produces two ATP molecules per glucose, and that's through anaerobic. But aerobic metabolism is the primary energy source of resting muscles and breaks down fatty acids. When you break down fatty acids, you get a lot more ATP. So skeletal muscle at rest metabolizes fatty acids and stored glycogen and creatinine phosphate. During moderate activity, muscles generate ATP through aerobic breakdown of glucose primary, primarily. That's remote, but during peak activity, pyruvate produced by glycolysis is converted to lactate. And that's giving you extra energy, more energy. So let's look at this. Muscle metabolism, the resting fiber. The demand for ATP is low and sufficient oxygen is available for mitochondria to meet that demand. Fatty acids are absorbed and broken down into mitochondria, creating a surplus of ATP. Some mitochondria ATP is used to convert absorbed glucose to glycogen, and mitochondria ATP is also used to convert creatine to creatinine phosphate. This results in a buildup of energy reserves, glycogen and creatinine phosphate in the muscle. Demand, as the demand for ATP increases during moderate activity, there's still enough oxygen for mitochondria to meet the demand, but no excess ATP is produced. And ATP is generated primarily by aerobic metabolism of glucose from stored glycogen. If the glycogen reserves are low, the muscle fiber can also break down other substances such as fatty acids. And all of the ATP being generated is used to power the muscle contraction. Now, during peak activity, the demand for ATP is enormous and oxygen cannot diffuse into the fiber fast enough. So only a third of the cell's ATP can, uh, needs can be met by the mitochondria. The rest of the ATP comes from glycolysis. And when this produces pyruvate faster than the mitochondria can utilize it, the pyruvate builds up in the cytosol. And the pyruvate is converted into lactate and the hydrogen ions from ATP hydrolysis are not absorbed by the mitochondria. So the buildup of the hydrogen ions increases cytosol acidity, which inhibits muscle contraction, leading to rapid fatigue. That's where you get that muscle fatigue. And I want you to watch this video on the other tape. So in the recovery period, the time required after exertion for muscles to return to normal the lactate removal and recycling or core recycle has occurred. Lactate is, re is transferred from muscles to the liver. The liver converts lactate to pyruvate, and most pyruvate molecules are converted to glucose. Glucose is then used to rebuild glycogen reserves. So actually the muscle is breaking down um, and producing a lot of pyruvate, and then the pyruvate gets converted back into, um, I'm sorry, the lactate gets converted, lactic acid breakdown is causing lactic acid, and lactic acid gets converted back into pyruvate, and the pyruvate gets breaking, broken down and used to make more glucose, and then you store it again. Oxygen debt, also called post-exercise oxygen consumption. After exercise or other exertion, the body needs more oxygen than usual to normalize metabolic activities, and the breathing rate and depth are increased. We lose heat or produce this heat when muscles contract and produce heat and lactic acid. So heat production and loss, active skeletal muscles produce heat up to 85% of the heat needed to maintain normal body temperature. 
Hormones and muscle metabolism, several hormones increase metabolic activities in the skeletal muscle, such as growth hormone, testosterone, thyroid, and epinephrine. Muscle performance, the force, the maximum amount of tension produced. Endurance is the amount of time activity can be sustained. Force and endurance depend upon the types of muscle fibers and physical conditioning. So we have red and white fibers. So there are three types of skeletal muscle fibers. We have fast twitch, slow twitch, and intermediate fibers. The fast fibers are the majority of skeletal muscle fibers contract very quickly. They're large diameter and they have large glycogen reserves, very few mitochondria, and they produce a stronger attack contraction, but they fatigue quickly. The slow fibers are slow to contract and slow to fatigue. They're smaller diameter and more numerous mitochondria, and they have a high oxygen supply because of myoglobin. That's the red pigment. So we have red muscle and white muscle fibers. And the red muscle fibers are usually the dark meat in a, like a turkey. And this is showing you slow fibers, the diameter. Intermediate fibers are mid-sized with very little myoglobin. And myoglobin is the protein that can exchange oxygen better in the muscle. So the, the red fibers have lots of myoglobin. That's what gives it that reddish color. And myoglobin is a protein that allows for an exchange of oxygen. There's, so intermediate fibers have a little bit of myoglobin, <coughs> where slow twitch have a lot, and the white have almost none. So the, the middle fibers are slower to fatigue than the fast fibers, but not as good as the slow fibers. So where do you see most of this um, white and red fibers? White, if you're looking at a chicken, like the chicken breast, it's more pale or turkey breast. The red is more like the dark meat or the legs or the wings. And most human muscles contain a mixture and, uh, of fiber types and are pink. When muscle gets stronger and bigger, it causes hypertrophy. The muscle gets thicker from heavy training. The diameter of muscle fibers, the number of myofibrils, the number of mitochondria, and the amount of glycogen reserves increase. When the muscle atrophies, there's a reduction in muscle size and tone and the power due to lack of activity. And as we age, the skeletal muscle fibers become smaller in diameter. The skeletal muscles become less elastic, and we get some fibrosis that increases fibrous connective tissue, and our tolerance for exercise decreases, and our ability to recover from muscular injury decreases. Muscle fatigue is when muscles can no longer perform at a required level. They are fatigued. And that's correlated with the depletion of metabolic reserves. Also, damage to the sarcolemma, sarcoplasma reticulum, and it, it declined, it becomes more acidic, which affects the pH, becomes more acidic, which affects calcium ion binding and alters enzyme activities. And then there's weariness due to low pH and pain. Physical condition improves power and endurance. Anaerobic endurance, 50 meter dash, weightlifting, uses fast fibers that stimulates hypertrophy, improved by frequent, brief, intensive workouts. Aerobic endurance is prolonged activities supported by mitochondria and does not stimulate muscle hypertrophy, but the training involves sustained low-level activity. The effects of training. Improvements in aerobic endurance result from alterations in the characteristics of the muscle fibers and improvements in the cardiovascular performance as well. Cardiac muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle cells found only in the heart have excitable membranes and they're striated like skeletal muscles. And cardiac muscle structural characteristics, unlike skeletal muscle, are small, typically branched with a single nucleus, have short, wide T-tubules, no triads, have a sarcoplasmic reticulum with no terminal cistern, and are almost totally dependent on aerobic metabolism. Contains lots of myoglobin, many mitochondria, and contact contact each other via intercalated discs. The intercalated disc is unique in, in cardiac muscle only, and it has these specialized connections that join the sarcolemma of an adjacent muscle cell to another. 
and it has these gap junctions, which are, if you remember, they're tubes of proteins. I call them the deuterus. They're protein ion channels, and they, and they have desmosomes connecting the muscle to each other. So now this function allows for stabilization of adjacent cells, but it allows ions to flow from one cell directly to the next. So the cardiac muscle cell, when one cardiac muscle cell contracts, all the other cells in that, in that chain of cells connected to each other will contract at the same time. And we call it a functional syncytium, S-Y-N-C-I-T-I-U-M, a functional syncytium. The top of the heart is the atria, the two atria, right and left atria. The bottom of the heart are the right and left ventricles. There's a connective tissue separating bottom from the top and a connective tissue covering right from left. But the top of the heart, the atrium contract all together as a functional syncytium. And the ventricles at the bottom contract all together as a functional syncytium. So when one muscle cell in the atrium contracts, all the muscle cells in the atrium will contract together in unison. When one muscle cell contracts in the ventricles, all the ventricular cells will contract together in, in, uh, in, as a rhythm. So we have two pacemakers in the heart. You have the sinoatrial node and the atrial ventricular node. So the top pacemaker causes the top of the heart contract together. The bottom pacemaker causes the bottom heart to contract together. And they're all beating in rhythm. So you get that lub dub sound which is the sound of valves closing and opening because when you contract the top, it pushes blood from the top down through the valves and then the valves snap open and close. And then the bottom contracts and pushes blood through the valves out through the aorta and the um, pulmonary artery and it snaps open and close. So you're getting a lub-dub sound because of these functional syncytiums contracting together. Lub-dub, lub-dub. And the pacemakers are the ones that trigger it and each cell fires once the pacemaker cell fires. Showing you the intercalated disc, the cardiac muscle. Here's the cardiac muscle with its branched intercalated disc. This is a skeletal, no, cardiac, excuse me. This is a cardiac muscle showing a little different layout and it doesn't have terminal cisterns, does it? Okay, because the ions are flowing from one cell to the next. And then cardiac muscle has a automaticity. So they contract without neural stimulation at a pace. And it's controlled by the pacemaker cells. Although there is a nervous system to control the rate and increase the rate or slow the rate or the force down. So the nervous system can alter the pace and tension of the contractions. Contractions last 10 times longer than those in skeletal muscle and the refractory periods are longer. And wave summation and tetanic contractions are prevented due to special properties in the sarcolemma. Smooth muscle found in your integumentary system and the blood, the cardiovascular and respiratory systems, the digestive urinary system, reproductive system. And so in the integumentary system, you have the erector pili muscles that stood the hair on straight up. In the cardiovascular respiratory system, you have blood pressure flow, air flow. In the digestive system, we have the sphincters and movement along the intestines. And then the reproductive system, we have the transports, the gametes, and expels the fetus. So the structural classifications are characteristics of smooth muscle. They're long, slender, spindle-shaped, single central nucleus, no T-tubules, myofibrils or sarcomeres, non-striated muscle, smooth, scattered thick filaments with many myosin heads, Thin filaments attach to dense bodies, and the dense bodies connect adjacent cells transmitting contractions. No tendons or aponeurosis. So there's a smooth muscle. And the functional character of smooth muscle. Smooth muscle differs from other muscle tissue in excitation, contraction, coupling, length, tension relationships, the control of the contractions, and the smooth muscle tone. Excitation, contraction, coupling is from free calcium ions in the cytoplasm triggering the contraction. The calcium ions bind with something called calmodulin, and that activates the myosin light chain kinase, 
which allows the myosin sites to attach to the actin. The length tension relationships, due to the lack of smart sar the lack of sarcomeres, tension and resting length are not directly related. Even a stretched smooth muscle can contract. Plasticity is the ability to, to function over a wider range of lengths. So smooth muscle control of contractions, there are multi-unit smooth muscle cells, which are innervated in motor units. Each cell may be connected to more than one motor neuron. You have visceral smooth muscle cells not connected to motor neurons arranged in sheets or layers. Rhythmic cycles of activity controlled by pace setter cells. And then you have normal background level of activity and smooth muscle can be decreased by neural, hormonal, or chemical factors.